If you got a Bible, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. We are continuing our series in uh, 2 Peter, and uh, obviously we um, know that Peter wrote this uh, letter, and um, it was one of the letters I haven't uh, been able to teach through, so it's been neat to uh, go through this and actually teach through it, and Peter starts off chapter 1, um, pretty much where he started off in 1 Peter, and pretty much where Paul starts out, talking about who Jesus Christ is, and uh, just as important in that day, it is important in, as today that when you talk about your faith and you talk about someone else about the gospel, and what I mean by the gospel is the saving message of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news. And so when you talk about the gospel, the non-negotiables, right, we can differ on a lot of different things. Some people praise a different way. Some people, you know, worship different ways. Some people pray different ways. Some people do a lot of different things in their service than we do, but coming together as Christians, the non-negotiables is, uh, is the gospel, the good news, who Jesus Christ is and the salvation that was provided in him. That's what Peter starts with. Here is this Jesus. He is all things that he said he was, and he is all those things. He has proved it to me, and you can know it as well. And in this salvation, if it's the real deal, these things will be evident in your life. And, you know, in the Bible, anytime you have true salvation or authentic salvation, there's always a change. You know, there's always um, something that happens in a person's life that produces a change. And that is not, uh, you know, that is not earning your salvation. That is showing evidence of salvation. And some people, it's right away. There's a massive um, evident change in their life. Some people, it takes several years to change. But for you as a Christian, if you've committed your life to Christ and you know the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it will eventually work its way out to where you can see these evidences in your life. You cannot be the same and know Jesus Christ. He changes your life. Um, I saw on, before I came up here, um, Josh put on the live stream that the Ness family was worshiping with us tonight, all right? And so um, Josh and Courtney, most of you know, they had their baby, um, Micah, I mean Malachi, I'm sorry, Malachi, and Malachi um, is at home, and yet when you think about uh, I was just running down memory lane thinking about the first time I took Tucker home and uh, we got in the car and we went home. That's when it really set in that things were about to change. And boy, did they change. And they changed almost every area of our life. It changed, you know, I even said before, you know, it changed even my truck, my car, all the, I mean, it just changes your timing, where you can go to dinner, how you go to dinner. Um, you know, it changes everything. It even changes your sleep patterns, right? And um, it changes all those things. And so when there's a new birth that comes into the family, it changes everything. It's the same with the new birth of Jesus Christ in your life. It changes everything. It changes the way you talk. changes the way you think. It changes the way that you um, view things and how you um, talk to people. And all those things change. And so Peter starts off by saying... Here's where you are with Christ. It, it brings this change. And then he goes on the offense against the false teachers. He says, we're under severe, severe persecution and trials and suffering. And, you know, for me, I've learned in my lifetime that when there's suffering, there's trials, there's persecution, um, that's when the devil takes it up a notch. You know what I mean? Like, he is the ultimate cheap shotter, I like to say, you know. Um, some people say don't kick somebody when they're down. Well, that's what he does. Um, when he sees you're down or he sees that you're struggling, um, that's when he goes for the kill shot. You know, that's when he goes, works overtime. That's when he really, really ramps it up. And these believers here were going through extreme persecution. They were, they were going through trials for being a Christian. They were going through extreme suffering. They, the government was um, uh, put them under persecution. And so a lot of them was looking around saying, okay, is it worth it? Is this really worth it? Is this message of Christianity? Is Jesus real? Is the salvation real? And Peter was saying, listen, take it from me. I, I've been on both sides of this. Jesus is real, and it's worth it. It's worth serving the Lord. It is worth serving him and suffering for righteousness than suffering for evil. And, and he says that in 1 Peter, and he follows it up in 2 Peter. 
And he begins to explain to them these false teachers that creep in and teach um, false doctrine. And we, see, we have seen it um, here in these scriptures, and we see it today. Um, a lot of false teachings, a lot of different concepts of what salvation is, a lot of different concepts of the Christian life. And he's saying, be on guard, be ready, be watchful for them. Because um, they, 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 they need to know, you need to know who they are, you need to identify them, and you need to know that they're going to be dealt with. That God's justice turns slowly, but it turns surely. That it's going to happen but we're going to continue that thought here in chapter 3 because we left off with Peter talking about um, how, uh, how, the, how God deals with him. And we talked about the flood, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the flood here as well and the judgment of the Lord. And he talks about how, how sure God's judgment is going to be and how we can take comfort in that and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Second Peter chapter 3, let me grab my Bible. I forgot my Bible over here. I would turn to it on my iPad, but if I lose my sermon, I wouldn't be able to uh, finish. So, 2 Peter, um, chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 1, um, Peter begins to lay out this uh, outline to stir us up and to remind us um, of these things. And so he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, Beloved, I will now write to you this second epistle. So, epistle was nothing but a letter. In both of which I stir you up or stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So he's saying, Here, beloved children, I, I want you to know this as those who are in the Lord. I want you to know I'm writing this to stir up your pure minds as a reminder. A reminder of what? What are you trying to stir us up about? He says, I'm trying to stir you up about. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before uh, by the holy prophets and by the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So Peter's saying, I want you to remember these things. I want you to stir you up to stop listening to the lies, stop listening to the false teachings, stop listening to the things that have no value. I want to stir you up or fire you up to go back and look at the established truths of the prophets, which by this time they knew what they were reading from the prophets in the Old Testament was true. And by this time, he was saying what we have said, uh, directed by Jesus Christ as the apostles, right? We have spoken these things, they are coming to pass, and you know these things are true. And, you know, for us as Christians, that's one of the most important things for us to do is to ask us, where do we find our assurance? Because you're going to need assurance, all right? And, and you're going to need that confidence of knowing what you believe and why you believe it. And the assurance comes, as Peter says here, I want to stir you up because you're focusing on all the noise. You're focusing on all the, all the false teachings. I want you to go back and get into the Word. Get back into what the prophet said. Get back into what the apostle said and get grounded in the Word of God and let that stir you up. And I would encourage you, if you are struggling with assurance, if you're struggling with assurance of salvation, or even here in this particular case, um, those who are suffering, those who are going through a hard time, those who were talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ being delayed, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can get so overwhelmed by all the false teachings that you forget what the Word of God really does in your life. And, and when we get to the Word of God, that's what fires us up. That's what gives us assurance. And that's why it's important. It's important to read your Bible. It's important for us to know what God's Word says. It's great to listen to sermons. It's great to listen to pastors. I love to listen to pastors. I love to listen to great sermons. Um, but it does not substitute me reading God's Word, me knowing God's Word. Um, we have to know God's Word because in God's Word, I'm going to tell you, a lot of times when you get in crisis situations, you get in suffering, you get in a point to where you, you are calling out on the Lord, it's usually not the funny story that the pastor tells you going to get you through that. It's not a, it's not a, a three-point outline of a perfectly written sermon, it's, it's, it's normally a scripture. It's a scripture, the word of God that you've put in your heart. That's why we say our Bible pledge. 
Your word have I hidden in your heart. I, I want it, it, you got to get it in your heart, and you know it's there. And when you go through this suffering, you go through this trial, as Peter's saying, as you get the word of God, that stirs you up. That, that, that gets, your, um, that gets your, your heart going. It, it fires you up. Most of you know it's, um, you know, it's football season. And uh, I'm a Gator fan, by the way, if you guys didn't know that. I like the Florida Gators. And uh, one of the things I like to do, especially Tucker, he always sends me these videos. And, uh, you know, the glory days, back when Florida was good. And uh, we didn't have to worry about playing Alabama and losing by 40 or 20 or how much ever it's going to be. But uh, we, we were the ones that nobody wanted to play. And so in that uh, speech that Tim Tebow gave at the national championship ga game against Oklahoma, he was saying it's 30 minutes for the rest of your life. You ever seen that video? I know you Gator fans had to see it. But anyhow, he's in the middle of him. He's talking about it. He's saying, let's finish this out. Let's, do, let's be strong. And they're all standing there. It's like, a, it's like a great pep talk. And they're all reminded of, he reminds them of the work they have done and the team that they had and the talent that they have and what the coaches told them. And he just fires them up. And they go back out there and they win. And they win the national championship because, you know, they're all fired up knowing that they're accomplishing what they're supposed to be accomplishing. That's what Peter's trying to do here. He's telling them, he's grabbing them by the, the jersey, and he's getting in their face, and he's saying, listen, I'm writing these things. Go back to God's word. Go back to what the prophets say. Go back to those things of the word of God and fire yourself up because you can't burn out. You can't fall out. You can't run from this. You got to get in God's word. You got to listen to what he says and let that fire you up. Let that stir you up and let the word of God stir you up and, and let that get you going. And, and he continues on in verse 2, I mean in verse 3, he says, uh, if you look at this, verse 3 he says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, a walking according to their own lusts. And you say, what is a scoffer? Well, a scoffer is someone um, who is a mocker. A mocker is someone who makes in front of or um, it makes in front of, I'm sorry, Aaron always makes in front of me for saying make in front of, but um, you wouldn't believe the lessons in language I get on the way home from the, from the boys and from Aaron and the rest of them, and I said, that's fine, you just want me to get up there and say nothing, is that what you want me to do, because they, they make me so nervous about what I'm going to say that I can't even finish saying what I say, but anyhow, if you, if you look to what he says here, he's saying these scoffers, these mockers, they make in front of, or make in front of, they, they take them and they, they, they say, oh, look at you, you're believing in God, you're believing in the second coming of, of Christ, are you kidding me, that's a joke, you're believing in the justice of God, look at the suffering, look at the pain, look at the sorrow, why would you serve a God like that, if he's even real, why would you? And they would mock, and they would, they would scoff. It's a scoffing, a mocking. And he's saying, know this, that it will come because they are walking according to what? Their own lust. So they don't believe in God. They are following the ways of the world. And so that makes them angry at those who do believe in God and have something they don't have. And I've heard this before, and it really makes a lot of sense. The people of the world hate Christians because God has given them something that the people of the world can't have. Because when you really think about it, the peace of God that comes, the joy of the Lord, the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit, um, that is something that is not available in the world. The world says, get more money, have more pleasure, um, have more fun, all these things, but yet it never satisfies. And so as they walk according to their lust, they become not happier and not more grateful and not more joyful they become uh, more empty they become more uh, painful they become uh, jealous they become they, they realize there's something more to life but they just can't find it and when they see somebody who has it it makes them mad it makes them mad and they scoff and they mock and he's saying listen those who walk according to their own lust they're going to scoff and they're going to mock and I don't know about you but if you watch the news lately, or you have talked about biblical principles in any sort of public setting, if you've talked about them in any sort of platform other than a home or a Christian church, um, you realize that the scoffers and the mockers come out really quick. 
All right, they, they are there, loaded and ready to take their shots. As soon as you say you believe in God, or as soon as you say you believe in Jesus Christ, be ready. The mocker's going to be there, and the scoffer's going to be there. And back uh, earlier, in the 70s and 80s, um, it was in the, even earlier than that, it really wasn't, uh, it wasn't popular to be a scoffer or a mocker. But as the 90s come in, and as the 2000s roll in, uh, the more that they knew Christianity stood and the things you stand for in Christianity, the more the mocking and more the scoffing. And so what it's done is it's watered down Christianity, and so now there's not a whole lot of scoffing and mocking to Christianity that we call in America because it's so watered down that all they could say is, we love everybody, God is love, you're loved, we're loved, stay as you are, be who you are, be happy. That's what Christianity in America is now. But when you stand up and you say you believe in the Word of God, you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe there are standards and convictions, be ready for the scoffers and the mockers. And they come from everywhere. And you know what's so amazing to me is that you take people who do not get along with one another, and when they come against a Christian, that they'll join up together to go against the Christian and scoff and the mock. Uh, kind of like when I was growing up. My brother could pick on me, but if someone else picked on me, guess what happened, right? He didn't like that. He would, he would join up and take my side. Well, same with the scoffers and mockers. They join up. They take sides. And those who are just sinful, they, they, don't, even, they don't even have to be full of the same sin or the same preference that they join up and they come against those things because they don't want to realize of their own lust is going to come to an end and they're empty and they're dry and so they scoff and they mock. And by the way, it's great when we have these scoffers and mockers because it reminds us to stay strong. It reminds us to stick to God's word. It reminds us to keep the faith. And let me tell you, if something happens to scoffers and mockers or people at your workplace or people at school or people that you come into contact with, guess who the first people they're going to come to when they hit rock bottom? They're going to come to those who stand strong, those who say they're Christian. They're going to come to you and say, now you're a Christian, right? I want you to pray for us. like, how did you even know I was a Christian? Well, because they, they watch and they know and they see something in you that they don't have. And even though they scoff and even though they mock, they need or they want, they desire what you have in God. And for us as Christians, that should encourage us to keep living for the Lord. That as we, as we encounter scoffing, as we encounter mocking, it's part of the deal. It comes with the territory. And especially, like Peter says here, in the last day, there's going to be more and more of that. And so it should not be surprising that when we see our world and we see the things that are coming to our education system, when we see the things that are coming to, through our government, when we see the things that are coming through morality in general, um, I, I got a pretty good laugh this week, by the way, because uh, we were watching the news and they were talking about in California um, how the recall election was going and they were talking about Gavin Newsom was probably going to um, retain and he was not going to be recalled and so um, they were said one of the candidates and they called they called it Caitlyn Jenner but it was really Bruce Jenner okay and so he says I'm just really upset for California because they deserve a normal person to be their leader I thought oh my goodness this guy who's now is think, trying to be a woman, right, is now saying that this guy was not uh, normal. And he's normal. And, he, and the Californian deserves a normal governor. It's like, oh my goodness, this is just crazy. Like, you could not have imagined this 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or 50 years ago. It's just, it really is crazy. And, and when you look at how far we've moved away from God's Word, and how far our culture, and how far all these things have moved away, and yet, when you come to God's Word, just like I said, there will be scoffers, there are going to be mockers, especially when it comes to the justice of the Lord, especially when it comes to the second coming of Jesus Christ, because they know, and as Peter teaches here and the Bible teaches, when Christ comes back the second time, it's no longer as the lamb, it's he's coming back as a lion. He's not coming back as a savior, he's coming back as the judge. And that strikes fear in people, that strikes a, a knowing that they're going to be held accountable. And that accountability drives them crazy to scoff and to mock because they don't want to give up their dark, uh, evil deeds and lusts. So they lash out against Christians. They lash out against the things of God. They scoff and they mock. For example, verse 4, Peter says, And saying, Where is the promise of His coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's, that was their excuse. It's always been this way. Even the fathers and the forefathers and the prophets, that nothing's changed. And you keep talking about God is coming. You keep talking about Christ is returning. You keep talking about the justice of God. But they suffered. And they went through persecution. They went through trials. And you're going through trials and suffering. Why would you keep, why would you keep believing in that? You don't believe, stop believing in that because the way the Father was, it's been like that ever from the beginning, from since the beginning. And in verse 5, Peter responds and he says, For this they will, they willfully forget. Okay? So, now, okay, you say it's never changed, but let me tell you, you willfully forget this that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that uh, then existed perished being flooded with water. He says, oh yeah, God doesn't judge. God doesn't judge the world. How about the flood? Did you forget about the flood? Did you forget about the Old Testament? Did you forget about the things that we read of the prophets and the things of Moses and the nation of Israel? Did you forget about all that stuff? By the way, that's a very popular thing right now, even in Christian circles. They're unhitching the Old Testament from the New Testament because they said a God of the Old Testament is a judgmental God. The God of the New Testament is no longer judgmental. He no longer has a judgment. He no longer has a standard. And so they're unhitching the Old Testament from the New Testament. And it's the same thing here. They're saying, listen, you, you didn't have all these things at the beginning. And Peter says, wait a minute. Did you forget about the story of the flood? It was of God's word that held up the, uh, held up the, the earth. And it, when he spoke, the world that existed perished. The judgment of God wiped it out. In verse 7, he says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word. He said, listen, the same God that was in the flood, that judged the world, is the same God right now that's preserving this world with the same word. And it's reserved... Not with water, but with what? Fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter says, wait a minute, I'm afraid to tell you that the judgment is real and it will come just as sure as the flood came. But the first time it came with water, the second time it's coming with fire. It's coming with fire. And that's why they always ask me, do you believe in global warming? I said, absolutely. <laughs> It's going to be global warming, all right. <laughs> it's going to be global warming, because the Bible says it's going to come with fire. It's going, to be, it's going to be fervent heat. And he says, here it comes. And the same word, the same God that's preserved that, he, he has the same, uh, it's the same God. Old Testament judgment, New Testament judgment. And it's reserved for the perdition of ungodly men. So he's telling them, don't fall for the trap. Don't fall for the trick. Don't fall for the false teachings. And it's tough to he says, it's, he says not to do it, but yet it's hard. I know it's hard personally. I know it's hard when you see others suffer, when you see others go through hard times, when you see others and, and you go through this process and Peter's saying, listen, you got to hear it. You got to know it. It's going to happen. Just as sure as you can read it then, it's going to happen now. And in verse 8, he says, uh, but, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. That the, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. He says, don't forget, we're bound by time, but God is not bound by time. Now, some people say this is a literal reference to one day and one thousand years. I'm not so sure about that. I, I don't know if it's one day to a thousand years, but I do know it, our timetable is not the same as God's timetable. God has no timetable. We have a timetable, but God doesn't have a timetable. He's saying, listen, uh, God is in control, and it, it just when you think that even a thousand years is nothing to God. A thousand years is like one day. It's nothing to it. And, and, and verse... Um, 90 continues, says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, but not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is important because this really shows us the heart of God. Remember, we talked about this in Jonah a little bit. Um, we talked about the compassion that God has for people. 
And a lot of people focus on the judgment part, and a lot of people focus on the hellfire and the brimstone, and yet there's a lot of people that preach that, and there's a lot of people that use that for motivation. But when you read through the Bible, the majority of the time when he talks about it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance, it's the compassion of the Lord. Yes, those are part of the story and part of the message, but when Peter comes there, he says, listen, one day is like a thousand years, but you remember this, the Lord is not slack. Listen, they're slack, but it's not the Lord. It's not, he's not slack. He's not lazy. He's not falling asleep. In the Old Testament, they would mock and say, is your God, when Elijah went up to, to, to call fire down, they say, is your God asleep? Is he using the restroom? Is he, is he busy doing something else? And, and this is what Peter's saying. He's not slack. He's not busy. He's, he's not busy or he's not, he's not unfulfilling on his promise as some count slackness, talking about those who are the false teachers, he says he's long-suffering toward us. Meaning that he suffers long with people. He's patient with people. And listen, a lot of people, they come to judging people and they're not so long-suffering towards other people, right? But when you use that same measure of standard on yourself, all of a sudden there seems to be a lot more long-suffering that gets involved, right? Right? Um, when you experience things, we were, I was talking about this just this week with someone. You know the difference between sympathy and empathy? Sympathy is that I could tell you I feel sorry for you. Empathy is I could look at you and say, I know what you're going through because I was right where you were. I've actually experienced that. And when you experience those things, all of a sudden, there's a whole new depth to your compassion. There's a whole new um, compassion and love that you have for people. And that's what Peter's saying. He, God loves us so much, he's long-suffering towards us. That he, is, he suffers long with sinners. He suffers long with those who don't serve God and don't judge, that, that, that are mockers and scoffers. And listen, we may have made the judgment, and we may want to pull the string, but God is long-suffering. And Why? It's because he's not willing that any should perish. It doesn't say that none will perish. It says he's not willing that any should perish. It's his desire that people come to know him. It's his long-suffering that is calling people to come to know Jesus Christ. It is his long-suffering that's delaying the second coming of Jesus Christ and the judgment of the Lord. And we're under the age of grace. And Peter's saying, this is what I know about the Lord. That he don't want one single person to perish. When we talk about the Lord and we share Jesus Christ, isn't that a great confidence to know that we could look at any person and say, God's not willing that you should perish? It doesn't matter the sinner. It doesn't matter the sin. We can look to them and say, God has compassion and he's long-suffering towards you and you have breath in your body and the grace of Jesus Christ is still alive and you can repent and God does not want you to perish. God does not want you to expire. And he says, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's desire, that is His will, and the judgment of the Lord will come, but it's not His desire that any, any should perish. And listen, that's Peter trying to set their, set their standard of how they look and view things. Listen, you think there's a timetable when you say, how long, O Lord, must we suffer? Peter says a day is but a thousand years, and a thousand years is but a day. It's not based on our timetable, it's not based on our compassion. Lord, I want you to judge. These people are evil. They are scoffers and they are mockers. But God says he's long-suffering and he, wills, and he doesn't want anyone to perish and he's waiting for them to come to know him in repentance. Man, you think about Peter and you look to the things that he says and you're looking at these people that are in extreme suffering, and extreme pain. It just it moves your heart because you really think about it. And it even, even deeper than that, when we get into thinking about the will of the Lord and we get to thinking about um, the process that we have in, in considering the Lord's ways, not just in his second coming, but just in his ways in general. You know, there's a lot of times when we question God's ways. God, why do I have to wait so long? God, when is there going to be a breakthrough? God, when are you going to change this situation? God, when, when is this going to happen? And without fail, it's just human nature. It's in us. We begin to look around and we say, well, God, why do they prosper? Why are they getting a, why are they, why do they have this and why do they have that? And why do we, as those who serve the Lord, why are we suffering? Why are we going through heartache? Why are we going through pain? Why are we going through all these things? 
And listen, Peter was dealing with us here, and, and, and you could even go back in the psalm. I encourage you to look at Psalm uh, 73, um, when David was going through a, an extreme time of just questioning the Lord's judgment and the Lord's uh, timing that he had in suffering. And uh, in, in Psalm 73, uh, David opens up and he says, Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as appear in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. So David was saying, listen, I know who God is, but let me tell you a little bit about my heart. I, I know what God's going to do, but let me tell you a little bit from my point of view. From my point of view, my feet had stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped out from me, meaning that I didn't know how long I could take it, but I knew I was right there on the edge of just falling off the edge. Like, I was on my way to abandoning the things of God and talking about God, and my steps and my heart and my feet were stumbling. Look at verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful. He said, man, I was, <laughs> here I was being, you know, humble and serving the Lord, and yet here was the boastful. And they, they uh, in verse, the second part of verse 3, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And it's, 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 it's easy to do, it's easy to look, and it's easy to say, look how prosperous they are, look how great the wicked is, look how the, 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 the evil is succeeding, and those who are serving the Lord are suffering. It's easy to do that, and it's easy to fall into that trap, just like David said, just like Peter's saying. And he says in verse 4, he says, look, there's, there's no pain in their deaths, their strength is firm. They, they're not in trouble as other men. They're not plagued like other men. Their pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them in like a garment. So he's saying these people are prideful. They're violent. They're bragging. They're boastful. Verse 7, their eyes bulge with abundance. Uh, they have more than heart could wish, right? He's saying, man, they have it all. They have everything. They're all, they have all this stuff. They scoff and speak wickedly. Concerning oppression, they speak loftily. Verse 9, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongues uh, walks through the earth. So verse 10, therefore his people return here and waters full of a cup uh, of a full cup and drained by them. He's saying, so these people go and they're prospering and they're full of wickedness, they're full of pride and they have all the things of life that you think anyone could ever have. And we who serve the Lord are coming back like empty cups. Like, like we, we can't even get a little water to fill our cups, that we're coming back empty. And, and David's saying, I'm returning and my cups are, are drained. Verse 11, they say, how does God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? Saying they're mocking him. You're serving this Lord and you can't see your prospering. You can't see the things that you have and you're suffering. You're going through pain. How well is that? And, and, and his people turn there and he's saying, how, how does God know? How, where is even God? Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. David's saying, listen, surely this was just, why did I even do this? I, I've washed my heart, I've cleansed my hands, I've searched the Lord, but yet I'm still suffering. They're still prospering, Lord. What in the world? Like, like I'm looking at this, I'm trying to add it up and it just don't add up. Like, I don't understand how I can serve, how I can, how I can uh, believe in the Lord, how I can claim your promises, and yet they're prospering, and yet I'm, I'm, I've cleansed my heart, I've asked the Lord to, to cleanse my ways, and yet here I am. Verse 14, all the day long I've been plagued, and I'm chastened every morning. It's like, man, it's like everything's caving in on me, everything's falling in on me. This is all in vain. Verse 15, if I had said, I'll speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. They say, listen, I was so caught up with this stuff, it, it was so painful for me, I couldn't even talk about it. I don't know about you, there's been times in my life when I've got to a point where I can't even talk about it. Like, you know, I used to think, uh, reading the story of Jacob when it said he wrestled with God, I thought, I wonder what that really means, you know? I've had a few wrestling matches at night with God, have you? <laughs> I was like, God, man, this is, I was wrestling with things. I mean, tough things, hard things. Look into the things that's happened in life and the suffering and the pain that you see people, and not just yourself, but godly people and children and, and all these things. You're going, God, where are you? What are you doing? And David's talking about the same thing. He's saying, listen, it's so bad that I got to a point where I couldn't even talk about it. 
It, it hurt my heart so bad. I was so discouraged that there was nothing left I could say. But there's hope. Look at verse 17. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Wow. It, it's the same thing Peter said. Peter said, in the world, you add it up. It doesn't add up. But when you go to God's word and you have the presence of God in your life, all of a sudden, when you get in the presence of the Lord, then you understand. Then you get a picture, not just what's here on this earth and not just what we see, but to the unseen. We, we see the things that are temporary, yet we must be looking to the things that are not, uh, that are not temporary. And when we focus our focus on God, not so much that our situation changes, but yet our perspective changes. Look at, what, look at what David says now. He says, surely you set them in slippery places and you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. And as in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors and as a dream as one awake. So, Lord, you, uh, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and, my, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, and I was like a beast before you. And David's just confessing, Lord, I'm sorry. I had the wrong perspective, and now once I've been in your presence, and now I understand the Word of God, and I have the hope of eternity, it changes my whole perspective. These people that I thought were prospering and were doing well, and I wanted to be like them, now I realize they're like in slippery places. They're, they can fall at any moment. When your judgment comes, they're, they're going to lose. And he says, I was even, my heart grieved, and I was foolish for even thinking of that. Verse 23, nevertheless, I'm continually with you, and you hold me by my right hand. You know, there's a gospel song that says, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. And, you know, I think of that picture every single time that, you know, even when we can't walk, you know, God pulls us up by our right hand and helps us walk through the things of life. I mean, it comes and it's tough. And he says in verse 24, you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, God? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you, Lord. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish, for you have destroyed all those that desert you. But it is good for me to draw near to God, and I have put my trust in the Lord, and this that I may declare all your works. Man, you want to talk about a turnaround? Man, David went in saying he was slippery, sliding, slope, and his feet almost stumbled, but he come to the presence of the Lord and understanding God's will and his way and his word, and he says he got into the presence of the Lord, it changed his whole perspective. He looked and he says, my heart and flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now listen, for, for Peter, this was real. Do you know why this was real for Peter? Because less... Then a week after he wrote this letter, he was executed. He was martyred. He, his sentence was already full. He, he knew what was going to happen to him. He knew it when the Lord told him back when he met him on the shore after his resurrection. And he knew it now. And he said, listen, this is real for me. All these games that people are playing in the world. And you know, that's what it is. It's just games. People try to look happy. They try to look prosperous. They try to think, have peace. And they try to have all the things. But you know what? All of it's temporary. All of it means nothing. All of it's going to come to an end. And they may live like it's never going to come to an end, but it comes to an end. And listen, it comes to an end personally, and then one day it's going to come to an end corporately, right? Like when Christ returns, and we're going to read uh, next week, we're going to talk about the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord. When it comes, it, it's, it's over. Like, that's it. And when you think about all these things and you think about how you lived your life and you think about how you live your life, you know, it's all a matter of what you focus on. It's all a matter of what you, you believe. And if you believe God and you believe the Lord and you believe the things of the word of God, Peter's encouraged us, look to those things. And like David, if you look to the things of the world and you get in suffering, you begin to think of worldly things, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to stumble. You're going to lose your assurance. You're going to lose your confidence in God. You're going to lose those things. And you're open yourself to, to hearing uh, all, the, all the scoffers and the mockers. And, and just like David and just like Peter, he's saying, listen, stand strong. Be firm. Get in the presence of the Lord. Know God's word. I heard one preacher say one time that if you live this life 
And, and this life is the worst that any Christian will ever face. But if you're not a Christian, this life is the best that anyone's ever going to have. And I could tell you that if this is the best that there is, then there's, there, I don't want anything worse than this, right? Because one thing when you get through life, you realize no one gets out alive, right? Listen, I, I'm going to tell you there's a lot of times when people look like they have everything together and they look like they have all the details and they look like they're prospering. But when you just sit down and talk to people for a while, you realize no one escapes suffering. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter. He said, you can suffer for doing good or you're going to suffer for doing bad, period. It's going to come either way, but when you suffer for the Lord, you're going to get a reward. Do you know that when you serve the Lord in the future coming of Jesus Christ or in the day when you stand before the Lord, it's going to make a difference. And it makes a difference when we think about it, we understand it, we believe it, and we live by faith and not by sight. And so maybe you're like Peter. And maybe you're like David. I don't know. Maybe you looked and your feet stumbling and your feet's beginning to slip and you just need to say, wait a minute, what really matters in life? What really matters with what I do and what God has given me? And yet sometimes with our timetable, we say, you know, God, I wanted this done five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But we got to realize it's God's timetable. God is never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. He's right on time when we need him. He's right on time when he, he, he says it's his time and his will and his way. And that's what you must submit to. And so I encourage you, as we look to these scriptures tonight, we look at Psalm 73. I encourage you this week to, to read that a few times, to think about it, to consider it. As we get more scoffers, more suffering, more mockers, the more we should go to God's word, the more we should realize and rely on the things of God and the things of eternity rather than the things that are not seen. So let's pray together. There.